thank you everybody for giving up your time today to join um, on the webinar. I'm Dan Loosley, uh, President of Forward uh, Movement USA. Um, I was just going to start with a very quick company overview. Um, I know I've met some of you on the call and just thought it'd be good to give um, an update on, on Woods as a company. I um, don't know how much everybody knows about Woods. Um, a little bit about our history, then I'll hand over to Andy Cardi for the main event for the webinar today. Um, so, so Woods uh, specialise in axial fan technology. Uh, so we manufacture products, standard off-the-shelf products and configurable ranges, um, which are available to be selected in our selection tool. Uh, we've also got a webinar on that later in the week, if you haven't already had a chance to, to join that session. And then we also offer very high-end bespoke solutions that are designed with our clients for maybe a tunnel and metro projects where there could be very strict specification requirements. Um, so we'll work with our client to optimise the solution for the application. So a little bit about Woods history. So the company was founded in 1909 in Colchester in the UK. Uh, we originally started manufacturing electric fan motors. And then in 1947 was when Woods developed and invented the first aerofoil blade technology. Um, and ever since then, Woods has focused on air movement, axial fan technology, and positions itself as a market leader in axial fan technology. Um, jumping forward to, to 1986, um, that was when Woods first entered the US market when we acquired American Fan Company. So American Fan Company from 1986 were selling the Woods product, the Woods JM, and our axial fan technology into the US market. In 2004, we were merged with a company called Flact, which is when the, the company was then rebranded as Flact Woods. Um, so Flact is an air treatment company. Uh, you might have seen their name um, out in the industry. They manufacture air handling units, whereas the Woods part is focused on air movement. Then in 2013, um, the American fan part of the business was sold off, which is when Woods lost its presence within the US market. Um, they were still selling the JM products and still selling the Woods brand. Um, so then in 2019, uh, we were in a position where we could reopen Woods USA, which is when we re-entered the US market. And we're now in the process of opening our new facility in Tennessee. So last year when I arrived in May, uh, the factory was a concrete slab. Uh, we've now got the factory built, assembly line set up, and we're recruiting the team locally and have now started assembly in the new site. So just a little bit about Woods footprint um, globally. So our headquarters is based in the UK, and then we have manufacturing assembly plants in the USA, India, and Singapore, and a new sales office in Germany with over 70 international distributors spread spread across the globe. So just a little bit about the applications that we, we focus on. Um, so Woods wants to be the partner of choice for its chosen applications. Um, so we focus on the tunnel and metro division. So road tunnels, uh, longitudinal type jet fan systems, also underground metro systems, and then the station extract fans. Then we've got garage fan applications where you could have thrust fans for pollution control or smoke extraction and staircase pressurization systems and atrium fans. So a lot of our products will be used in life safety systems to provide safe exit for occupants within a building. We take a lot of pride in our quality at Woods, um, so we don't position ourselves as being the cheapest manufacturer. We want to offer a quality product designed with our customers. So we, we x-ray 100% of all of our impeller component parts, also balance to high standards and strain gauge test any new product designs that we introduce to market. And this brings us on to the new site in Tennessee. So new factory is now open, we're now recruiting the, the team locally, and we have now started assembling products to dispatch to our customers. So the new factory is located in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. So we're about 30 minutes south of Nashville. Uh, it's 25,000 square foot. We have dedicated large fan and small fan assembly lines and capacity to do up to about 10 foot in diameter with an R&D lab AMCO accredited on site. 
So this can be a, a great asset to us to work with our customers locally to improve those lead times to market. And this is just an overview of what the new factory will be, be assembling. So we've got non-residential products. So we'll be doing standard axials and HD axials, which Andy Carter will take you into a lot more detail in the next few slides. Garage type fans, which will be coming in 2023. And then we've got road tunnel jet fans and station extract fans. So large tunnel products up to, like I say, 12, 10 foot diameter. And then we've got the OEM products. And then along the bottom, we've just got an overview of our testing capabilities in the new facility. So we've already done uh, first customer witnessed through the battery, including aero, thrust, acoustics, high temperature, vibration and overspeed testing. Right. And thank you. So that was just a quick company overview before we get to the, the main event. Um, so I'd like to hand you over to Andy Cardi, um, who is our product manager for Axial fans based in our UK facility. Um, so Andy is a, a trained mechanical and production engineer and a member of the Institute of Engineering and Technology and has over four decades of experience in HVAC. So extremely qualified to take you through through today's webinar. Well, thank you very much. Um, that was uh, good to have the overview and I'm um, really uh, happy to uh, be here today so that we can uh, go through a little bit about actual flow fans. So, uh, you know, I thought I'd show my face so you can see I'm a <laughs> real person. Um, but, um, you know, obviously you, I Andy. will close, close that down uh, as we go into the presentation to save a little bit on our bandwidth. Um, OK, so yes, actual flow fans um, or tube actuals. Um, I guess is the more accurate term um, that would be used in the US market. Um, so let's have a little look at what we're going to go through today. So tube actuals, um, what we're going to look at first is just really simply looking at the fan components and some variants of that uh, fan range. Um, a little bit about actual flow fan performance capabilities. Um, a bit about the impeller design and the linked customer benefits um, about you know the capabilities in terms of air volumes efficiencies and ease of installation so you know that's that's really the main topics that we're going to talk about so nothing really heavy um, at this stage um, so the first thing to say is let's have a look at essentially the anatomy of a fan um, Actual flow fans are really quite easy uh, and simple uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, so that's really the, um, the simplicity uh, is, is really the main advantage. Um, obviously, the, the main component that wraps around it is the fan housing. Uh, everything is mounted to it and in it, um, and that's the bit you connect to ductwork. Um, the impeller or propeller a hub and blade unit is, is really um, the key piece of technology that actually moves the air, produces the pressure. Um, now we mount, mount that motor in the centre of the duct with four mounting arms, um, which are very straightforward and marked in red, as you can see. And in the middle is a premium uh, NEMA electric drive motor, um, which is obviously um, meeting all the local US standards, UL um, uh, certified and so forth. So you know, that's really how a fan looks and goes together, um, although there's a couple of other things we should mention. Um, so on the top of the fan housing is a terminal box, so that makes it uh, really easy for installation, uh, electrical connections, can be made external, so there's no need to be sort of crawling inside the duct to try and find um, the wiring and connect direct to the motor. Um, all of that uh, wiring is held inside a conduit tube that goes down uh, into the motor. Um, so that's all protected from being, uh, you know, uh, overheated by the air going through 
the, uh, the Airstream. Um, when I talk about overheating, um, some of these uh, fan products can be used with the right spec of motor uh, and impeller um, for high temperature smoke extract. But we'll get to that a little later. So uh, you know, everything you know in terms of component spec is is based on you know, the design that's required. OK, so. That's actual flow fans, but I know that in the US market, probably the norm um, is to use a centrifugal blower um, rather than an actual flow fan, although I do know that you know, obviously there are actual flow fans in the market. Um, and so, you know, I thought I'd just have a little look and do a contrast and compare slide between an actual fan and the centrifugal blower. Um, so if you look at the fan features, uh, the first thing to say about an actual flow fan it has a small footprint compared with some uh, centrifugal alternatives. Um, that makes it easy to install and remove from duct work um, and the duct work is actually more straightforward to design because because the fan is in line in terms of airflow entry and exit the duct work can also be in line um, so you, that has a design implication as well as an installation um, benefit as well um, then you have a, um, a kind of bit of com comparison on efficiencies now, what we're talking about here is the efficiency of the fan as a, as a sort of total uh, efficiency of the impeller rather than the overall efficiency of the fan and motor, which I know is a little bit different. Um, but if you just compare impellers to impellers, um, typically uh, standard range actual fans are a little under 80% and centrifugal fans can be a little under 90%, um, but vein actuals can get into the mid 80s. I know this is not the main core range that we're talking about here today, but just to let you know, um, there are vein actuals available within our range as well as the tube actuals. So I just thought I'd mention that because you know it's relevant to the discussion about efficiencies. Um, then, there is this other uh, consideration that we ne really need to be understanding, and that is um, the drive uh, of the impeller. All of our fans tend to be direct driven. Um, I know there, there are some applications where belt driven or um, you know, indirect drive uh, needs to be used, but you know, really uh, in the, the case of getting the optimum efficiency, uh, you know, direct drive is really preferred because belts and pulleys, um, you know, obviously can introduce losses, so it makes the whole thing uh, less efficient. Obviously, the other negative part about belts and pulleys is that they break. Um, well, the belts do, pulleys can wear, but, you know, basically you need to do more um, in, in terms of maintenance on a belt driven fan. Um, now I know that belt driven fans were also required when you're talking about you know, perhaps commissioning uh, a fan and changing its performance, but now you know you've got the possibility of very reliable and quite a competitively priced um, variable speed drives. You know, yeah, there are other ways of achieving what you need to achieve now. Um, so, you know, belts and pulleys probably you know, less, less prevalent um, and certainly have some disadvantages. Now, there is this um, thing that I must mention about noise. You know, all fans make noise, um, be it, you know, what, you know, doesn't matter whether they're actual flow or centrifugal blowers. Uh, they're going to make some sort of noise. But the thing about a, an actual flow fan is that the noise that it generates is predominantly high frequency noise rather than a low frequency noise. Um, and because it's high frequency noise, it's very easy to attenuate by some silencing sound absorbing material um, because the silences can be then much shorter. 
due to the length of the uh, the, the waveform of the noise. Um, switching it round, if you look at the, the centrifugal blower, because they tend to uh, generate lower uh, frequency noise, it then means that that's a lot more difficult to attenuate. So, you know, from a noise perspective, uh, if there is a problem, um, if it's maybe a two pole machine running at sort of 3,600 RPM nominally, um, then, you know, obviously, if you do need to uh, add some treatment to that system uh, to, to kind of get within the noise spec, it's much easier to achieve with an actual flow fan. Um, from the, the point of view of flexibility of the solution, um, because our fan is uh, made in a particular way, the impeller in particular, uh, with adjustable geometry, uh, so the blades of the, um, the impeller uh, can be um, rotated around to different angles, um, that then means that, you know, you've got a bit more um, kind of flexibility when you're putting the design in. And even to the point where if the motor is big enough um, in terms of what's been installed inside the fan, you may have some uh, additional flexibility on site if need be. Um, whereas centrifugal blower impellers or wheels, they will be welded fixed geometry machines. So from that point of view, you know, they're, they're, you get what you get. OK, you can um, you know, obviously speed control them, but then you know, the same is true of an actual flow fan. Um, so what does an actual flow fan do? Well, in terms of general comments about the, the type of performance that it gives, it's high air volumes uh, and medium pressures. Now, obviously, if you've got a very high pressure uh, application, um, then a centrifugal fan might be the right thing to be putting into the system. Um, although we can offer multi-stage fans, which could get um, in excess of four kilopascals of, of pressure development. Um, so, you know, if you've got those sort of high pressures, have a, a, a chat with us because, you know, we may still be able to do something. Uh, but when I talk about high air volumes, you know, I'm I'm talking about very high air volumes. So, you know, we will go into that in a little bit more detail a bit further on in the, in the presentation. Um, and then the other thing to say is that because of the materials that are being used, um, we can only go up to about 750 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, which is actually quite, you know, a significant temperature. Um, but if if um, it is needed to go higher than that, um, we can extend that temperature range with steel impellers. And and for bespoke projects, for specialist applications, you know, we have done this in the past. So let's have a, a little look to see what the jury thinks. Yep, OK. Generally speaking, you know, the actual flow fan comes out um, reasonably well, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty good in comparison with a centrifugal blower. Um, obviously, the efficiency is something we need to be looking at, but I'm, you know, telling you that um, vein actuals are available and can you know, increase the efficiency. But the other thing to kind of really sort of bear in mind is that, you know, it's not just the impeller efficiency that is important. The motor efficiency is also something to take into consideration. So it is possible to actually change up the motor spec to get uh, an even higher efficiency if if needed. So from that point of view, yeah, that's just a, a bit of an overview of, of the uh, two main types of uh, fan, really. I didn't go into any of the other subtypes, but they're the, the main two that you come across, I guess. So. Having looked at that, um, what um, is the JM actual tube range? Um, and you know, what does that really look like in terms of overall performance and, and features uh, and benefits? So really, I just put this one slide together uh, to just kind of encapsulate 
what the range is so that you know it's, it's real simple to understand what that is so 12 inches nominally up to 63 inches um, air volumes up to uh, just in excess of 123,000 um, CFM um, and just a little bit above uh, 9.65 uh, inches water gauge. Um, now you can see there the sort of test regime that we use, but you'll also notice that those two standards, ISO 5801 and BS 848, are uh, international or uh, British standards, but we also test um, in our AMCRA uh, accredited labs. Um, we've got uh, one in the UK and also one um, in our US operation. Uh, we test to AMCA standards, so you're talking about 210 and 300 for um, yeah, uh, performance, aero performance and, and noise respectively. Um, standard temperature uh, ventilation is designed for 104 degrees F. Um, now, because we're also trying to persuade people about the merits of smoke extraction in buildings, um, obviously to try and give enhanced safety to occupants and also to um, provide uh, an extra level of protection for firefighters. Um, smoke extract is, is another option that we can offer. So uh, there is a range of fans that sits alongside the standard temperature ones that are rated at uh, 572 degrees Fahrenheit for two hours. Um, in terms of the robustness of the, the, the fan, the housing is hot dip galvanized. Um, we've, we've got um, motors, as I mentioned, that are NEMA premium. So that's equivalent to the European IE3 standard and they're UL listed. Um, IP55 ingress protection is standard. Uh, and as I mentioned, um, pretty low installed noise levels because of you know, the, the frequency spread. So that's the range in general. So um, there's a couple of options that I just want to talk you through. Um, the first of those options is the casing or housing length. So um, the general, generally speaking, the uh, the standards that we use for the, the uh, housing is a long case, a long housing that covers both the impeller and the motor, as you see on the left hand side. Um, Depending on the application, um, and you know, it could be because it's a customer requirement to have a shorter casing um, because of weight, uh, or maybe um, a, a limitation in size. Uh, we can do a shorter casing. Um, that's not coming out of uh, the US uh, operation just yet. But, you know, I guess you watch this space, you know, it will be there quite soon. Um, so there are these two options, but HVAC, uh, typical um, standard fans that go into ductwork, be long cased because, you know, it's it's much easier to handle on site. So that's uh, the casing options. The next thing to talk about is motors. Um, now there are uh, other there are other types of motors other than the two that are here. Uh, the, the other main type of motor, I suppose, in terms of um, form, uh, is the um, flange mounted motor, um, typically used in in other industries like pump industries. Um, we do use that occasionally in some of our other specialist fans. But generally speaking, these are the two types that you'll you'll tend to see. Um, foot mounted motors I'll get to in a sec, but the pad mounted motor, as you see on the, um, the left hand side of the screen, that's the standard mounting arrangement that we use um, both in the Colchester UK range and in the US range. Um, and it's simply because 
aerodynamically, uh, it's much more efficient uh, to have it mounted in this way of four supporting arms that are equally spaced around the uh, circumference of the uh, uh, the casting of the motor. Um, and that's because it, it actually um, gives less uh, disturbance to the air, uh, and therefore where you get less disturbance to the air in terms of um, the turbulent air. Um, if you can make that air smoother, more laminar, uh, then you can get a much more efficient solution. And so, you know, four mounting arms equally spaced is, is a much better proposition from that point of view. So it gives you more performance and a quieter fan because turbulence equals noise. Um, so if we then switch our attention to the foot mounted option, which is on the right hand side, um, the foot mounted option, whilst it has you know, one thing going for it, maybe, uh, which is it's a standard motor for most motor manufacturers. Um, we've got a, um, a, a supply chain arrangement with uh, WEG uh, USA where they've got pad mounted motors for us in sufficient stocks to back up um, customer requirements. So from our point of view, we don't see you know, pad mounted motors as a disadvantage and technically they are an advantage. But, you know, obviously foot mounted motors, um, you could potentially get them off the shelf anywhere, maybe. Uh, and for the larger fans, for infrastructure fans that are used on uh, tunnels and metros type applications, you know, pad mounted motors then don't, um, are not really uh, practical. They become un unpractical above a certain size. Um, so, you know, foot mounted motors are then used. So in this particular case, we're showing um, a foot mounted motor. You can see a, a support um, set of um, uh, steel work down here, uh, which obviously disturbs the air on this lower half of the impeller. Um, the other thing is that um, you'll see that in this particular example, I've put a poor example in just so I can talk about it which is it's got a, a huge terminal box on the motor and then that's right next to the impeller. Uh, and so from an aerodynamic point of view, that's not a great uh, solution. Um, so uh, we would obviously talk with our uh, motor supplier and request that this terminal box is not only a low profile box, but it is then moved to this end of the motor casting which they can do by simply reversing um, this motor casting here. Um, that's usually a fairly straightforward thing to do in most motor um, um, manufacturers lines. So, so that's really just encapsulating the two uh, motor types, but the real, um, the real thing that uh, is the heart of the uh, of heart of the fan is not the motor, although that's pretty important because nothing turns otherwise. Uh, but the key and the heart of the fan is, uh, of course, the impeller. Um, and so, really, you know, this is a kind of a typical section of the impeller blade. And the first thing that you can see is it's an aerofoil section, um, and the other thing that you might spot by looking at that slide is that it's actually an aerofoil section that is a modified version um, of a wing design that was used on an Airbus aeroplane. So it's actually, you know, um, something that we've developed from observing very efficient wing sections. Um, and for the same sort of uh, reason, uh, you know, aerofoil sections on an aeroplane produce lift, but in this case, obviously, it produces an airflow. So if you rotate the blade in that direction, and obviously the broader end of the of the blade is is the leading edge, um, then you get an airflow induced in, in that direction. So uh, you know you you will get uh, work done on the air. Um, now I've given some details of the design of the impeller, but I'm not going to talk about that really in any 
kind of detail. Uh, it's just that you can see that it's got a twist along the length of the impeller, um, which is obviously um, treating the air at different parts of the impeller blade slightly differently because air flows are not equal across uh, the whole of the blade. But in twisting the blade in a such a way, we can even that out a little bit. So, so that's the blade section. Um, now, there is um, that's just a general kind of description, I suppose, of of a blade. But we have several different designs of of blade uh, and a hub. Uh, so you know there are various different um, impeller designs which are designed for different applications to do a different job. Um, and one of those different jobs is um, a true reversible um, impeller. Uh, as denoted by the um, the kind of term JMTSP. So JM is just a, the blade design, the base blade design, which is um, what uh, we're talking about uh, in this slide. But then we modified it um, to give a truly symmetrical um, type of uh, performance, uh, which means that if you run the fan in the reverse direction, you get a very similar within one or two percent of the uh, of the forward uh, performance. You get very, very similar performance in reverse uh, as you would in the forward direction. And it's designed to do that. Um, there is a bit of a trade off um, on the perform on the um, efficiency of on the performance side, um, but you do get this very equal uh, performance in both directions and that can be very useful where you've got a fan that is designed as a supply fan to a space but is also capable of an extract uh, duty um, so you can actually you know simplify your design uh, in that way um, and the p on the end of that code just means it's designed and op optimized to be a pressure developing fan so it's designed to go into a ductwork. And the, the reason we, we did that is because there are um, jet fans that are designed to go in tunnels that have got a similar impeller, but they're optimised for thrust rather than pressure development. Uh, so that's really more of an internal code for us, but just in case you're curious what that meant. So the next thing really, other than talking about the cross-sectional of the impeller and a couple of different variants, is to look at another little factor which um, is really important. And some manufacturers don't actually kind of um, take this too seriously, but I just wanted to kind of talk about it. And that is the, the tip gap, uh, the gap between the end of the blade and the housing of the fan. So obviously uh, you can make that gap bigger or smaller uh, when you're designing the fan. Um, if you make the gap bigger, that's great when you're putting the fan together because it makes it really easy to, to actually uh, assemble it in, in the shop. But the point is that if you do that, it does have an impact on the performance. You can make it really quite very small, that much tighter tolerances on that gap, but then obviously it makes it a little bit more difficult to put together. But the implication is this. So you can see on this chart, um, there's a red horizontal and vertical, um, two uh, lines, one uh, horizontal, one vertical in red, uh, and that shows you the sort of performance that you get out of our selection tool for a, for a given curve. Um, but now we're showing us a, a, um, an alternative in green, uh, which gives you 10% extra pressure development. And that's achieved by reducing the tip gap from 0.1 of an inch to 0 0.4, 0 0.04 of an inch. Um, so, so you can see, you know, it's really quite a small gap. However, if you go the other way, um, the blue lines, you can see that if I double the standard uh, gap, 
uh, to 0.2 of an inch, uh, you get uh, a big reduction in pressure development, 16% in this case. Now, obviously, if you've got a high temperature fan or a fan that can be used for high temperature fans, um, uh, anything that is being spec'd for a, a high temperature use um, will need to take into account that the al aluminum of the blades will actually expand as, as the temperature goes up. So you have to have a bigger gap. But what we do is we design the fan to give you the duty um, that is spec'd um, plus the leakage factor. So you, you definitely get what, uh, what is in the design plus a little bit more. Um, and obviously when it, the fan heats up to the design temperature and that gap closes down and the loss reduces, so you, you still get exactly what you need. Um, but I just thought I'd point that out because some manufacturers do build fans with quite a large gap, and that's really just to make it easier to build. Um, whereas, you know, we understand, and I wanted to point out what the implication is on the performance. So that's um, tip gaps. Um, and obviously the gap is obviously this bit here, um, but, you know, that's fairly straightforward. The next thing to kind of understand in terms of the fan build is the form of running and the standard form of running is what we call form B. Um, and it, the reason for this is that I put some red arrows which show the sort of um, try and visualize the, the airflow. Um, so you can see uh, that the airflow before it gets to the impeller um, is very uh, steady and laminar, um, so there's there's very little turbulence in it. Obviously, as the air goes through the uh, impeller, it will um, stir that up, and there will be um, turbulent air coming off the back of the impeller. Um, but by that point, most of the performance has been generated, so the impact on performance is 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 fairly minimal. Um, the other thing is because you've 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 you're doing it that way round, uh, the turbulent air is then moving away from the fan quite rapidly, rather than uh, being um, uh, manipulated within the impeller. Um, so it is a quieter solution, and that's the sort of optimum performance for a ducted system. Now, if you go the other way around, so the air passes over the motor first before it gets to the impeller, the motor and the motor supports uh, will actually um, cause some turbulence in the airstream, as you can see uh, from this sort of representation. Um, and then that causes turbulence to going into the impeller, which effectively reduces its efficiency and its performance and because the energy um, that would have gone into performing more airflow or pressure development is now going out into another form, which is noise energy. Um, you can hear that turbulence in terms of you know, a noisier fan. You can hear uh, the buffeting of the air uh, around the impeller uh, inside the housing of the fan. So you know, that way around, we can do it that way around. Uh, we can build fans that way around, but you know, just be aware that, that there is this difference in performance. So that's really, you know, the thing to say, turbulence reduces efficiency. Um, and that goes as a general rule for system design. So if you're putting a fan in a system and there's a corner, a bend just before the fan, which is generating some very turbulent air, that's um, going to make the performance of the fan uh, reduce. Uh, relative to a fan that's in a nice straight bit of duct. So it's just something to bear in mind. Um, so that's kind of the build options, really, and you know the three main things that we're really thinking about, which is uh, motors and impellers, and the, the, the way that we uh, put those motors and impellers in the duct work. So the next thing is to just have a quick uh, overview of the duct or the housing. Um, this is a steel uh, 
um, item, uh, basically spun uh, with flanges on the ends uh, and hot dip galvanized. Um, and galvanizing is a, is a pretty robust uh, anti-corrosion solution. Um, and so, you know, what we've what we've done here is is sort of used this for for many years uh, as an option, which is uh, quite a general purpose thing. Having said that, um, if somebody wants us to apply a particular um, paint finish, different spec uh, to cope with um, you know, different corrosion um, kind of scenarios, uh, that's something that we can also have a discussion about. Um, design is very, very simple, um, and the um, terminal box that I mentioned earlier, that just simply bolts on so we can minimise the amount of uh, welding that goes on. So that's the casing. Um, there's, there's a little bit to say about um, different fixings uh, or fasteners. Um, so there are various different types that we use or different types of finish that we use depending on the application. Basically, we just take a, a very careful look at the environment into which this is being used uh, and then look at the materials of the fan, making sure that uh, we haven't got a, um, you know, a, a, a situation where the fixings and the casing are causing galvanic uh, kind of corrosion. So we we look at that sort of mix of materials very closely to make sure that you know you, what you end up with is a very robust um, kind of solution which repels um, as much as the corrosion um, as possible. And you know you get very long um, um, kind of life service lives with these particular fans. Um, I think the longest uh, or the oldest um, example that we've we've seen recently, I think somebody said to me that um, they they found a fan that somebody wanted a new motor for that happened to be uh, something that we manufactured in 1958. Um, it's a little difficult to find a motor of the same spec, you have to say, but uh, it does prove that our fans can last uh, quite a long time if looked after properly. So. From that point of view, you know, we, we take great care with the material spec. Um, and then just a little bit about a bit more about materials and design of the impeller. Um, we talked about the blade in a bit of detail, but there's there's a bit more to um, the uh, uh, impeller or propeller unit than just a blade. So what we're really talking about is a um, hub and clamp plate design. So I've shown just one half of the hub and clamp plate unit on the uh, left hand side with uh, all those ports uh, into which you can see the blade which has got a, a root portion um, go though that fixes into those ports and then another half of the hub which is very very similar um, is then clamped onto uh, the other half uh, with all the blades in place um, those smaller holes you can see um, have fixing um, bolts through. Uh, so those those fasteners then allow us to clamp those two things together to make it a nice robust impeller um, kind of a assembly, which is then mounted on the end of the motor. Um, so so that is um, usually made, as I say, from aluminium or uh, which is LM6 as an alloy um, which has good corrosion resistance uh, or we have a different alloy that we use for higher temperatures. Um, as mentioned by Dan, we x-ray inspect uh, all those rotating parts because you know we're really passionate about reliability um, and the tip gap um, control is, is very uh, important in terms of uh, what the performance of the fan is. So we control that um, to a high degree. Um, as I mentioned, pitch angle is adjustable um, so that we can give the optimum performance for the application. And the balance grade that we usually um, offer is G6.3, 
uh, but there are lower balance standards that can be applied um, and we have done that uh, depending on the design of the, of the fan. So that's the main kind of uh, description of um, the propeller unit um, at a top level. But there is another thing that we just need to get into a little bit about um, you know, the flexibility of the components that we use that because um, you know, those components can be put together in different ways and that will influence the performance of the fan. So let's have a look at a thing called um, solidity. Uh, so, so basically what I'm showing you here is that there can be a number of different hubs, so the centre portion of the propeller, which can be uh, anywhere from about, about 19 and a half inches um, down to about six inches in diameter, um, roughly speaking. Um, and those different hub sizes, because they then have different number of ports that you can put impeller blades into, you can then have uh, flexibility of how many blades you put into those hubs, uh, all the way from five blades at the bottom, although some of those hubs you can go down to three blades even, um, right away up to 12 blades if you have this uh, largest hub. Um, so, so as you can see, uh, there are different um, kind of uh, numbers of blades that were added and and the fully loaded impeller is the full solidity impeller uh, and if you obviously have half as many blades that's known as half solidity and that's kind of just a visual thing how much does it block up um, the uh, the airway I suppose so that's just kind of a way of describing that full solidity half solidity two-thirds solidity um, now Having said, yeah, we can put these things together, these components in different ways. What is the practical kind of implication of this on the performance? So what we're trying to uh, kind of get across here is that on the right hand side, you've got um, actually five different performance envelopes going from all the way down here, uh, which, you know, you're, you're talking about an inch and a half water gauge maximum pressure development down at this lowest one uh, up to about nine and uh, well uh, inches on this one um, and what we're trying to kind of illustrate is that that effectively is the same fan uh, with the same impeller but with different numbers of blades um, installed so three six or twelve and then we get to another concept, which I'll talk about on the next slide, which is multi-stage fans, where you can put two fans, one behind the other in the ductwork. So, you know, with two fans with six blades in the impeller, you can get up to over six inches uh, static water gauge. Uh, and then if you have two fans with 12 blades fitted, that's where you can get your sort of uh, nine inch plus pressure. Uh, development. Um, and from that point of view, you know, it does make it a very flexible solution for customers um, when we're designing uh, something for them. So that's uh, solidity. Um, and as I said, um, those top two uh, charts, those performance charts there are based on two fans um, kind of fitted together not in a regular kind of way. So what do I mean by that? Well, uh, add multi-stage fans are actually contra-rotating. So you will see that from this, this little drawing on the left hand side that the rotation of the first stage is in the opposite direction to the second stage. And the reason that we do this is that we preload or pre-swirl the air on from in the first stage to make it um, enter the second stage at the most optimum angle. So we, there, we're very careful about the angle of the impeller blades, one relative to the other. Um, and in doing this, rotating them in opposite directions, 
you actually get nearly three times the pressure development rather than two. So it is quite a, a useful um, way of getting a little bit of extra pressure. Um, and not only that, you, you get higher efficiencies in doing this because you're optimizing the airflow um, through the impeller. Um, so where you need pressure development uh, way above two inches water gauge, uh, you can get these efficiencies um, that are easily achieving 85%. So, you know, it's it could be something that, you know, you consider. It has the other option uh, or advantage of if you've got two fans, one motor fails, let's say, um, some um, supply issue occurs and the motor uh, goes down, as long as the other uh, motor is still working, you do get some airflow. Yeah, you don't get you know full standby, but you do get some air. So it's, it might be something again that's important um, for a particular application. So that's kind of an option there. Um, when I say multi-stage, I mean I've only shown two stages here, but it is in fact possible to go to three, four, or five stages. Um, you do get to a limit eventually where the compressibility of air comes into the equation uh, and then you know you're really talking about more you know something that's more like a compressor than a fan but you know it is possible to have more than just two stages if you need to to get extra pressure development if that's what you need so so that's um, really gone through the various key components and a little bit about you know how we can modify the performance. Um, so the, the next slide, what I want to just show you is how we kind of code the fan um, to kind of give you a bit of a clue as to uh, what the fan in looks like or how it's made. In fact, uh, I do have to apologise. All our fan codes are based on SI units, so apologies up front for that. Um, but, um, you know, this this code, which is how we code it, this particular example, uh, the 125 is the diameter in centimetres. Um, right, so yeah, that's just, you know, for our internal kind of manufacturing, really. JM is an impeller designation of a family of impellers. Um, there are other impeller families available, but this is the one we're talking about right now. Um, and then the size of the hub in this particular case is 40 centimetres, uh, so you know, normally eight inches. Um, four pole, so uh, for uh, the US market, you're talking 1800 RPM um, and nine blades, um, fully loaded on a pillar there. Uh, and then finally, the angle of the pitch of the blade which is very much linked to the performance of the fan. Um, it also defines the motor power as well. So from that point of view, that's the coding kind of logic that we use. Um, so you, know, you can kind of see where we're coming from there. And then just a real look, quick look at accessories. Um, so when you're trying to mount this fan into a system, uh, what you need to do is to you know, support it somehow. Um, so mounting feet, um, they bolt to the flanges on the end of the housing. Um, and then underneath those feet, uh, you can put anti-vibration mounts um, because then you're allowing the fan uh, a little movement because you know, there may be a little bit of movement um, from that fan as it rotates. Uh, you will need to have some flexible connectors and some clips to hold those connectors in place uh, and they fix to matching flanges um, on the end of the housing. Uh, so those are bo uh, bolted to the end of the housing. Um, sometimes there will be a need to have a fan um, and then a standby fan, so a duty fan and a standby fan in this uh, scenario I'm talking about fans side by side so in parallel not series as my other example uh, in that case 
you might then want an air operated damper. Uh, so it's a non return uh, damper effectively so that uh, you don't get uh, the fan uh, performance or the airflow just recirculating around a loop. Um, so that's what we would use that for. Talked about attenuators or silencers. Um, this particular example um, has a central pod uh, which has got some more material in it, so that will give an uh, enhanced um, noise reduction. Um, they're also available in different lengths, normally one times or two times the diameter of the fan. Um, just just to sort of uh, make it real simple. Uh, if the fan is mounted in ductwork, but not um, you know, in the middle of the ductwork, it's at the end of the ductwork, let's say. And so one side of the fan is actually open um, to improve its performance. Um, what we would suggest is a bellmouth entry or a cone entry um, that goes on the inlet of the fan. It just smooths the uh, airflow entry into the fan and makes uh, an improved uh, performance of that fan. Um, and then obviously because it's on the end of the system in this scenario, uh, we, we certainly don't want people you know, getting their, their fingers inside the fan. When it's rotating, so we'd always suggest a safety guard. So those are the sort of um, main um, mounting accessories that we suggest. Um, although silencers and dampers probably only used in particular search, search situations. So that's the overview of those parts. What I want to talk to you um, now about is a little bit about the engineering design tools that we use. Um, so one of those tools is um, something that we called computational fluid dynamics, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, so we refer to it as CFD. Um, but basically it's a way of building a virtual model of a fan um, and then doing a lot of what if scenarios um, in terms of you know, what does the airflow look like if the fan is uh, design is changed from a base design to an enhanced design? And this is what we're, we're trying to show here. Um, so what we've got in the top half of the screen is a representation of a fan with an impeller uh, with um, blades that have just a plain section uh, you know, there's nothing kind of too complicated going on here. Uh, and then, you know, you can see a blade here uh, represented by this dotted line and you can see some um, areas of high um, turbulence before and after the blade. Or, um, so and then at the tip. Uh, but if we put some features on the trailing edge of that blade, uh, we can reduce that, as you can see, you know, the red areas are reduced. Um, so we can do all of that work um, in a virtual way before we've even you know, cut any metal and built any fans. And then, of course, what we then do is we actually build a prototype and test it to see whether it matches the model. So you know, that's one tool, CFD. Um, we also use CFD for systems as well, so we can use it to um, in a garage fan design um, kind of um, work. We can use that to look at the airflows in larger spaces to see where those fans need to be to get the optimum um, smoke control um, scenario in place. Um, so it's not just a fan design, it can be a system design tool as well. Um, the other fan design tool, though, is um, a thing called finite element analysis, so FEA. Um, and so again, we're building a virtual model of a fan. Um, and, and then we're creating extreme scenarios where we stress those components. This is an exaggerated uh, flexing of blades um, and you can see that the areas of red 
are areas of stress. Uh, we then look at those areas very closely in terms of you know, the material content, the different sections that are designed in those places, uh, the spec of the material in terms of, you know, what is its failure stress level, um, and then make sure that we design uh, that fan uh, with those blades and hub combinations um, to stay within those maximum limits. Um, we do build in quite a high level of safety, so, you know, it's um, uh, generally, if we say it will do the job, it will do the job and some more. So it's, you know, it's, we're not kind of trying to design it to the ragged limit. Uh, but the point is, yeah, we can do all this work um, again before we've built anything. Uh, and then once we've actually refined it, uh, we can, you know, do the uh, actual prototyping, uh, get the prototype um, items into a lab. Uh, and then we um, attach strain gauges to do the physical test to see whether those physical strain gauge readings match what we said in our model. Um, and then, you know, obviously we can just double check our design. Uh, and that's what we did. Um, and then this is um, showing a newer fan that we've actually um, developed in the last five years or so. Um, which is a JMV high efficiency vein actual, um, but the same principles apply to the JM uh, tube actuals, uh, exactly the same tools we used. So having kind of looked at the sort of the visualizations of stresses, um, we can also use FEA to, to look at how forces act in various planes in various parts of a blade and uh, we can actually see exactly what that force is and what direction that force is acting in um, and we can then see you know where those stresses are uh, make sure the material is appropriately um, kind of specced to make sure it does the job so you know F FEA um, plus CFD are very um, key tools for us in our engineering design team so I haven't talked about the design uh, kind of elements of the process. Obviously, this all leads to uh, us ending up with a product. Uh, and in this particular case for America, we've got a product which is a JM2 tube axle, um, which is designed for standard temperature. Um, so that's the 104 degrees Fahrenheit version. Uh, and then if it's needed um, an emergency smoke extract capability uh, up to 572 degrees F for two hours. Now, what I haven't said on this slide is that what we, we, what we do is that if we build a fan that's capable of 570 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, it's obviously by virtue of that um, capable of a, a standard air temperature duty as well and what we call that is a dual mode fan and the, and the advantage of that is that you have one fan in your system not two um, and your fan can be used for normal ventilation um, for hopefully all of its life but if it's called upon in an emergency it can uh, step up to this smoke extract um, duty and uh, extract the smoke out of the building. So that's really the concept behind what we do. Um, so that's the kind of range concept uh, in terms of the tube actuals. Um, and I did mention that I was going to just briefly go through a couple of other product variants. So just to sort of finish off, there are a few other products I just want to take you through. OK, now I do have to apologise that all of these performances that I'm showing you here um, are based on a 50 hertz um, uh, electrical supply. But in essence, what we're talking about in general terms is that you normally get about 20 percent more airflow uh, and obviously um, a, an associated increase in pressure as well. Um, but not 
all products can kind of be run at 20% above uh, the performance that's shown here, but most of them can. So what we're talking about here is some quite big fans. Um, we're talking about um, fans that are, um, you know, 11.6 feet in diameter. Uh, so that is a big fan. Um, and you're, you're getting some very high airflows. And when I was talking to you about, you know, high airflows in an earlier slide, 763, almost 763,000 cubic feet per minute. Um, that is um, quite quite a respectable airflow. Um, at a pressure of 13, over 13 inches water gauge um, in this particular case. Um, but if you go to the uh, unidirectional version of that, which is one fan to the right, um, you can actually get uh, 16 inches of um, pressure development and also an increase in airflow up to uh, 847 and a half thousand CFM. So, you know, that's that's a serious amount of airflow. Um, we, we do, as, as I mentioned, some vein axles. Uh, the KMG aerofoil is a vein axle fan, um, comparatively small fan at just over five feet in diameter, uh, an airflow of about 131,000 CFM, just under nine inches, uh, static water gauge. Um, but those guide vanes are actually built into the fan, whereas the next fan, to the to the right is a JM airfoil with guide vanes where these are bolted on as a separate unit. Um, so again, you know you've got a up to a 5.25 uh, foot diameter fan um, and a little bit of extra uh, airflow, uh, nearly 138,000 CFM at about uh, eight inches static water gauge. Um, and then finally, um, a small specialist range in stainless steel, which is only up to about three feet in diameter. Uh, but again, you know, you can get uh, quite a reasonable um, pressure development from that fan. So that's sort of um, a range of fans which go from sort of infrastructure fans that are on the left hand side to kind of more specialist uh, fans on the right hand side. Um, the next kind of set of fans I just wanted to talk about quickly uh, was um, uh, basically where are these fans here? So you've got some high temperature fans here. Now there are three fan families mentioned here. Um, the one on the right hand side, um, which is 600 degrees C. Uh, so um, that's of over 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, I believe, if I do the maths. Um, that is a, a very specialist fan. It's uh, you won't see these um, too often, uh, but they are used for underground applications, especially in uh, metro systems. So you know, it is possible that uh, that you will see this. Um, and I say we've got this range. Uh, that goes up to 49 inches in uh, in diameter, um, which will give you a, about 70,000 CFM, about four inches static water gauge. So that's that specialist fan. But the other two, um, the one in the middle and the one on the left, uh, they're what we call bifurcated fans. So the motor is actually in a tunnel, uh, out of airstream, protected from the um, the uh, higher temperature air, um, but these are designed for continuous use. So they are, you know, 24-7 uh, usage at those temperatures. Um, and obviously, you know, if you've got a system where you need those higher temperatures, uh, a bifurcated fan would be the option here. So just wanted to make you aware of them. You probably won't see them too often, but if you need something like that, that some this is the, the something that might solve that problem for you. Um, and then finally, um, I just want to talk to you about garage fans. 
briefly. Uh, this is something Dan mentioned right at the very beginning. Um, and uh, we have an alternative um, way of providing ventilation, pollution control and smoke extraction uh, in a fire scenario uh, without ductwork. Now that's kind of um, a strange thing to say because a lot of more traditional uh, garages um, will have ductwork and fans in that ductwork, um, but there are several disadvantages to that, especially if you have low level ductwork. Low level ductwork in a garage can get damaged and then the um, you know, the ability of that to perform in an emergency then gets reduced. Uh, whereas if you have things at high level um, and less ductwork, it actually, or no ductwork in this case, uh, you can actually have a much more robust system. Uh, and we use CFD to design these systems so you can visualize exactly where uh, those um, smoke plumes will go. Um, because computers are not always 100% um, reliable in terms of, or might not be seen as 100% reliable in terms of, you know, just because the computer says, you know, the air goes this way in a system, does it really? Uh, or the smoke, will it go this way uh, when there's a fire rather than that way? We, we also do um, cold smoke tests in car parks uh, and garages where um, you can actually you know, put some cold smoke in and see where it goes uh, and see how effectively that smoke is actually extracted uh, and moved around to the extract points. Um, so we don't ever just rely on computers. We always do a double check um, in, a, in a real life scenario. And we've done a, num a number of those um, both in the UK and across Europe. So, you know, we've we've got quite a lot of experience as far as that's concerned. Um, this slide shows you a cylindrical fan, which has got an actual flow fan in it. And a, uh, a sort of a, a very much low profile um, cased unit, which has got a centrifugal fan in it. Uh, and we do both those types. Um, for for garage applications. So hopefully um, what I've said makes sense. Uh, if it doesn't, uh, please ask questions. Um, and hopefully um, some of those solutions might actually help you out and um, we can we can provide you with some product. So thank you very much for your attention and all that remains for me to say, here are our contact details. Now you will have the opportunity to get hold of this um, slide deck. And the other thing I'd say is that there are bonus slides after this because we're only on slide 35 and this deck goes to 56. The bonus slides give additional information. I'm not going to talk about that today, yeah, yeah. but it's all there. Yeah, Hidden content. <laughs>